Okay, um, welcome back everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce for this afternoon's session Richard Heitner, who stood alongside me to my right, who will present on item seven, and then, then also lead two subsequent panel sessions to close our welfare focus today. Um, Richard will give his thoughts on, uh, from an external perspective just now, and I just wanted to give you a bit of background to him. Um, Richard's formerly Saatchi and Saatchi's worldwide deputy chairman. His uh, uh, management consultancy, Beta Baboon, helps, test, helps leaders around the world to, as he puts it, rip apart, play with, and solve their business problems. He's a professor at London Business School. He teaches um, degree and executive education programs on leadership and creativity in business. He co-founded the Manchester United Supporters Trust, is a director of the Foundation for Leadership Through Sport, a coach to the management board of the Metropolitan Police in London, and in spending much of his career as a chief executive, Richard's book, Consiglieri, Leading from the Shadows, celebrates those who support, counsel, challenge, and check the ultimately accountable leader. He's an accredited business coach. He recently entered racehorse ownership in Great Britain after falling in love with the sport after completing some vision work for British racing. Please welcome Richard. Thank you uh, very much, Nick. It's an enormous privilege to, uh, to be here and to have got to know so many brilliant people in horse racing over the last 12 months. Um, I've always loved horses. I was allergic to them, though, and still am. Uh, so during this 12 months, um, uh, Nick and his colleagues have probably seen me weeping a bit too often at the race courses, but I am undeterred. I love them. I love them since my grandfather uh, had me in front of the television uh, watching racing on a Saturday afternoon. And um, I can't credibly claim I have been a horse person, uh, but I absolutely am now. These are my three beauties. You won't have seen any of them uh, yesterday, uh, but you may soon. Calvadoge is a four-year-old gelding in training with Paul Nichols, stage star also with Paul Nichols, and Tambourine Girl, uh, who's with uh, Roger Charlton. Tambourine Girl has uh, come second and third in her last uh, couple of outings, and that's netted me one five thousandth of the prize money, uh, because as the astute amongst you will have seen from my attire I can't really afford these horses outright, but the Owners Group and Australia, I give you a big, big thank you for bringing to the world syndicate ownership. I think it's fantastic. So, as far as I'm concerned, um, I, I feel deeply emotionally bound uh, into the sport again. Professionally, I have an enormous admiration for all of you, all the sports participants, and particularly uh, in the context of today, the way that this ecosystem of so many disparate players from all over the world, uh, but whether uh, owners, trainers, uh, breeders, bloodstock agents, jockeys, the horses themselves, somehow you conspire to collaborate and coordinate the greatest show on earth happening so many days of the year, every day of the year, so many times a day. So it's a deeply impressive affair. It may sound perverse then, as a radical optimist and enthusiast of your sport, uh, that I see many parallels between the challenges you've been discussing this morning and those that I've encountered uh, in my work with many organizations across the world um, in all sorts of sectors, from professional services to uh, pharmaceuticals, automotive to airlines, um, banking uh, to uh, lots of other sectors. And these these challenges include a kind of a difficulty these days to grow organically from the position you have been in. It comes from a kind of relentless pressure on prices that force uh, you to defend whatever premiums uh, you're attempting to charge. And more than anything, uh, it's driven by an ability when people do innovate with something extraordinary, uh, an ability for others to copy that and copy it really fast, which means that in most industries I'm dealing with, the leaders are facing the chill winds of commoditization. I think it's even more challenging than that these days because particularly for those of you in horse racing, but uh, not exclusively, uh, the leaders I work with, um, I take my hat off to them because 
they are operating under the most intense scrutiny that I've witnessed in certainly all my years uh, in the marketing communications business. It's really punitive. I, I kind of look at this room of uh, people I call alpha baboons, the ultimately accountable leaders, and I look in awe that you're prepared to take these positions of responsibility in the public glare uh, when people can be so quick to race to judgments, mostly unfair, often uh, really vitriolic. There's some other challenges too. Unfortunately, we're all guilty of falling for the seductive power of services that heighten our expectations, whether that's Amazon delivering something when we're in crisis on December the 24th because we've forgotten our spouse's uh, present, um, or to Uber arriving in a nanosecond with data allowing you to see the face of the driver. We've all got used to a great deal more for a great deal less, and I'm sure your racing public is no different to that. So have those who work for you. Emerging talent that you will need to bring into the sport have totally different expectations of you as employers uh, than perhaps, um, I would say I'm not alone in this, those of us of mature years in this room and when we came into the workforce. Add to that the difficulty of really creating an enduring distinction for your brands or for your uh, organizations or indeed your sport because as somebody said earlier, it was John Gosden said, we're in the entertainment business. And another of the panelists said, you know, we're competing with other forms of entertainment. So all of these things make it incredibly difficult uh, to stand out, to appeal to new audiences, and to make the resources you have available stretch even further to create a new and enduringly bright future for racing. There is, of course, a way through, uh, and it starts with purpose, and purpose has been mentioned already today. Dr. Stewart actually said uh, in answer to a, a question, this is why I do what I do. He didn't say this is what I do, but this is why I do it. And all of you in racing and all business leaders increasingly must have an answer to this London fund manager's challenge of if they cannot tell you in a short paragraph what they do, why they do what they do, how they do it, then I assume they have no idea what they're doing. And so the question here is, um, can you find that answer for racing across the world? Would you have the same answer for horse racing across the world? Some of you may feel that doesn't matter, that as long as your own organization has an answer to that, that's okay. But unfortunately, um, all organizations now need to find an articulation of their purpose their aspiration, their ambitions, that are capable of giving their leaders and the people they lead the courage to make the kind of changes that you're discussing here today. Leaders should, and most that I work with, and certainly all that I've uh, encountered in your sport, do care about the legacy that they wish to leave. They do want an answer to that question, what kind of human being am I in the eyes of those closest to me? And leaders do have a responsibility to create some hope for the next generation. So my question, what hope will you be creating for horse racing's next generation in the actions that you choose to take, specifically today, in relation to equine welfare? To encourage you, even bankers are taking purpose really, really seriously. And it may seem to you self-evident why you do what you do and that there's beauty attached to that. Uh, but under uh, scrutiny, um, bankers, all kinds of businesses are having to kind of grip this um, challenge of articulating their purpose. Um, this is what Larry Fink, chairman and CEO of BlackRock, the big investment house, he's the latest kind of pinup uh, for purpose in business fashion magazines. Uh, here's what he had to say last year. Without a sense of purpose, no company, public or private, can achieve its full potential. It will ultimately lose its license to operate from key stakeholders, succumbing to short-term pressures to distribute earnings and in the process sacrifice investments in employee development, innovation and capital expenditures. I'll leave that thought lingering uh, with you. Um, 
It was uh, Cricket Head, Madam Head, who said before, this cannot just be all about the money. And that phrase is being heard more and more, even in the most commercial, hard-nosed business environments like banking. This letter he sent to shareholders last year got some, uh, quite some airtime in the, in the public, and so he issued another one uh, more recently. And in that other one, he talks about the fact purpose uh, is there to unify management, employees, and communities. It drives ethical behavior, creates an essential check on actions that go against the best interests of stakeholders. So I think ultimately great purpose inspires courage, it drives the kind of transformation organizations wish to bring, and it equips uh, people with an ability to make decisions even when they're representing different interests in an ecosystem, and even when they're starting in the clearly obviously different context, both cultural and operational, that you're operating in horse racing. So where is horse racing when it comes to this kind of definition of purpose? Why you do what you do? how you do it, who you are, what you believe in. And to test that, um, given the robustness of your responses before, um, I'm going to ask for a polling question now, please, on purpose. Uh, so fingers on the buzzers. Uh, you're going to have 30 seconds, any minute, to answer the question. When it comes specifically to this idea of aspiration and common purpose in horse racing, which of the four best describes your view. Number one, we're clear about our purpose and we live it every day. Number two, we have a purpose, but our commercial objectives come first. Number three, we don't have a purpose, but we'd certainly benefit by having one. And number four, purpose is for the business world, not for us in horse racing. So 30 seconds as the purple column to the right uh, sets you your time. Okay, if you have failed to vote, you've missed your chance. I hope there's no political voting going on. Here we go. It's 43% saying we're very clear about our purpose. 37% saying we've got one, but money comes first. Madam Head had it on the money. Uh, we don't have a purpose, but we'd benefit from having one. 13% purposes for the business world. So there's a kind of majority up the top there. Um, we do have a purpose or we have one and the money comes first. Let's come back to that in question time. I think it's pretty important that um, we, I'm going to just move us on here now, thank you, that um, you need one of these purposes both for offensive reasons because great purpose, actually it's proven, heightens performance, commercial performance. Most of the academic studies uh, that I've observed actually show now the increasing correlation between having a really strong sense of social purpose and making more money. So in that, those of you voting for, for number two in that previous uh, poll, if you're really interested in money, you might want to reflect a bit more on the purpose, largely because those investors who you need to put their money into the sport are now making their investment decisions based on uh, stakeholder engagement and governance and environmental factors, and I'm sure uh, that pertains to you too. Um, and indeed, in some, uh, in some jurisdictions, let's just take America, uh, should Elizabeth Warren um, get into the White House, this is coming at you anyway. They're just going to legislate for purpose. It's not just an internet thing. Uh, you'll see there top left, uh, and I proudly put this up, this is David Beckham wearing a green and gold scarf of protest against the uh, ownership of Manchester United, uh, my favorite sporting institution, uh, uh, by the Glazers. It actually started as a protest movement by shareholders, including me, um, to stop Rupert Murdoch buying our club. Um, we succeeded there, but failed in, in the Glazers taking ownership. Uh, and this green and gold actually emanated as a story. And one of you talked about the importance of beautiful stories. This is bringing back the romance of the original club from which Manchester United was formed. So anybody, you don't need to be a whiz on social media, can get a protest up and running. 
whatever that issue happens to be, whether it's LGBTQI, uh, whether it's veganism, uh, whether it's indeed uh, in issues closer to your own home. Resourceful campaigners can find a way to make their voice heard, whether or not uh, the issues are uh, fair or unfair to deal with. We've got Greta Thunberg, of course, and she's now uh, the superstar when it comes to climate change, but she's not on her own. Actually, a little bit of research will show that there are many more young people who've got very prominent positions as activists in their own markets, whether that's uh, Nina Gualinga, uh, Autumn Peltier in Canada, she's a, a Canadian clean water and climate advocate. These are all people uh, who can get stuff done and will make a noise. Therefore, I would suggest uh, that you ignore your detractors at your peril. And um, you, you can uh, make light of them if you choose. Uh, you could go to war with them uh, if that's the way you frame the debate. But I think you have to be quite nuanced about this and understand that the context in which people are making their ethical judgments has shifted quite dramatically. I'd like to give you some examples from business, if I may. Uh, and again, this is to demonstrate the need uh, to the 86% of you who loudly agreed with this in the poll earlier, that when it comes to welfare, you need to either get further ahead and or act now. That's 86%, 26% saying you need to act now. Uh, so uh, loudly agreeing with this. But the examples I would just share with you not through judgment in any way, but simply to inspire the panel that's shortly to join me to think through what principles you might apply to your own context. I'd like you to compare Barclays and BP. Barclays, uh, there was a bank, along with many banks, suffering an enormous reduction in trust and confidence. Um, coming up to the financial crisis, but certainly after it, and exacerbated by the LIBOR scandal. What did Barclays do to take action? Well, apart from having a really robust look at its culture and embedding new training and development, new professional practices within the business, it sacrificed something. It took out the investment bank. It severed the link between the retail bank and the bank that had fundamentally been making most of its money. So it made a very significant sacrifice that cost it in the short term. If you look at BP post the Deep Sea Horizon disaster, and currently struggling with, clearly, climate activism. They launched a very expensive PR campaign. They spent 200 million pounds protesting that they were beyond petroleum. And the facts proved that. They were doing a lot of good stuff to promote clean energy, to innovate new, cleaner forms uh, of fuel and, and, and energy. However, too slow, and fast forward a few years, last week only, the Royal Shakespeare Company, iconic arts organization in the UK, severed its very lucrative sponsorship deal with BP. It didn't really want to. It couldn't really afford to. It's now going to have to find money from somewhere else. But why? Because not just leading actors didn't want to be associated with this company that was seen to be toxic, um, but a great number of young people were simply staying away from the theater because of this association. So like it or not, that's the position BP is in. It has recovered. It has just turned out some good commercial results, uh, but it has not acted quite as quickly as, um, as Barclays. Let me give you one more. Um, let's just take, uh, well, why don't we take Oxfam and J&J. &J. You would have thought the Oxfam crisis um, would have been really an existential crisis. So you'd have thought that given the importance of safeguarding children, any threat and abuse to children would be a kind of license withdrawal activity. As it happens, their very sincere and very loud apology, their immediate 10-point plan openly published has bought them time to recover and they will survive and I'm sure thrive. J and J, manufacturer of the opioid drug, a service to many people who need relief from pain, could not be uh, held responsible for foreseeing that that drug would have unintended and very harmful consequences, nor that it would be oversubscribed. But right now, again, we might ask the Americans in the room, those who are familiar with J&J, &J, 
Is it, is it wise to simply go to court, deny all responsibility and fight, 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 because that is probably financially the astute thing to do, they have judged, or might they be better served by opening up to the uh, activists and engaging in a debate? There is more examples to boot, but I would like to extrapolate some principles and just put one more of these three to the test in a poll. Um, we've examined the power of purpose, and I would say the room is not yet entirely convinced by that, uh, but that needs to kind of take a look at what you stand for and why. Uh, there are two other principles, though, between the winners and the losers. I think the winners are enthusiast embra enthusiastic embraces of transparent. My former chairman once said to me, uh, Richard, my friend, there are no degrees of transparency. You either are or you're not. It's like honesty. So just how transparent is racing? How transparent does it need to be? I think it was uh, Madam Head who get, again said, um, trainers need to open up their stables. So just to stretch that metaphor, how much are you prepared to open up your stable, the world of racing, to detractors and promoters alike? Let's just take a look at the poll questions, please. So specifically when it comes to welfare and transparency, which statement best describes your view? One, we're already completely transparent with the public. Two, we're transparent enough with the public. Three, we need to be more transparent with the public. Four, we have so much more to do to be trusted by the public for our transparency. You've got 30 seconds. And if we could take a look at the results, thank you. So, very few saying we're completely transparent. A fifth of you nearly, transparent enough, but actually a great deal of appetite to be more transparent. Uh, and well over uh, a third of the room, uh, four out of ten of you thinking, we have got much more to do uh, to be transparent. So there's a, a great kind of uh, um, playback to you. I think there are two other ideas that the other companies, certainly in business, that I would uh, draw parallels with might uh, offer up to you. And they are that um, the great companies, those that really are dealing with the kind of reputational challenges they have and the opportunities they have, deal in, in empathy. They reach to their active critics and bring them in, not in a cynical way, uh, not in an insincere way, but in an authentic way to try and better understand the position uh, that their opponents are taking. It's been sadly, sadly missing in British political discourse and in many other uh, parts of the world. But that ability to say, we can have intelligent, constructive debate, we can hold two opposing ideas uh, in opposition and give equal thought to both uh, would serve, I think, all industries well. And the final thought is this one, that it doesn't matter how many good reasons you can find to educate the public, and you should, and you've got many more to educate them with. In the end, we reason, uh, with, we, we reason with conclusion. We act on our emotion. And so much of the sentiment uh, around welfare is, I'm afraid, a hugely emotional one. And that's been played out already this afternoon. So if you're going to tackle any kind of perceived negativity, I would encourage you to do that with fact, of course, and with clear, compelling evidence. But in addition, you have to be prepared to deal in the emotion. And as John Gosden's movie uh, showed, and as many of you have said on the panel already, you have these beautiful stories. You have this incredible, incredible, rich history. And it's on that, I believe, that you should be drawing far more. Maya Angelou said, after today, we will forget what was said in relation to welfare. Um, we might even, though we have to do it, do some stuff 
But in the end, on welfare, you have to decide what feelings you would like the public to have and deal in those. So if we could just play a movie uh, before I welcome the panel up on stage. Acción, me anda dejando el teléfono. Pensá que no salimos campeones desde el 86. Eso. Y Brasil tiene tres copas más que nosotros. Y el otro día nos ganó Chile. No puede ser, no puede ser. So, with apologies to our Argentinian friends in the audience. Um, I feel very, very lucky to be able to introduce three fantastic uh, panelists now, if they uh, would join us on stage. We have Victoria Carter, uh, who's coming from, uh, obviously you know, New Zealand. These three are all known to you. Serial entrepreneur, uh, founder of City Hop. She describes herself on her Instagram page as bold, brave, and grateful. She is not going to pull her punches. She comes from the world of business and politics and PR, 15 years in racing, and uh, describes herself as a gentle boat rocker. So be prepared to be rocked, Victoria. Thank you very much indeed. I take particular delight in welcoming Rishi onto the stage as a panelist, so I get to ask him the questions, uh, known already to all of you uh, from this morning's brilliant uh, panel. Rishi, thank you so much for joining us. Um, amongst his many talents and passions uh, are, of course, many other sports, so I'll be uh, very keen to hear Rishi's thoughts and intelligent uh, commentary on what we can learn from Worlds Beyond Racing. And she was scheduled to do this, but successive Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe trainer uh, is now successive panellist appearer, uh, Madame Crickethead, who's joining us by popular vote, back on the panel. Thank you very much. So I suppose I should start with you, Victoria, as the, the boat rocker. And uh, just to ask you, um, reflecting on the polls uh, already conducted by Nick and these most recent polls, um, what have you observed from your world of business uh, that you think might be of interest and, uh, and potential use to the world of horse racing? Thank you. Um, I think it's listening today. I think we shouldn't be defensive. This isn't a war. We want to bring more people with us so that then we've got more owners. Um, and w in New Zealand, um, I've, I was um, reflecting that we've had some real issues with our dairy and our fishing industry. They are seen as non-sustainable. Um, the fishing industry is uh, overfishing and taking too many small fish. The dairy industry, if we got rid of cows tomorrow in New Zealand, we would have achieved the Paris Accord but I doubt we will get rid of cows because that is the backbone of our economy. Um, but what I've noticed in the last 12 months is that their governing bodies have recognised that they've got an issue with public perception. So they've been very artful in social media, in PR, with newspaper stories, with um, advertising on television that show us the dairy farmer getting up early in the morning, getting his children off to school after he or she have milked the cows, We've seen the fishing boat sailing off in beautiful countryside, landscape, sea, and it's the feel good. There's none of the ugly stuff. It's all the things that make you go, wow, this is beautiful. And we've got so many beautiful stories. We all, we've heard that already today. But I think we don't do a great enough job of selling them, telling them. And I think that's all our responsibility. Mm. Thank you. Rishi. Um, from the world beyond racing, your other sports passions, cricket perhaps, you know, what, what, what have you seen that you admire that could be imported into this sport? Innovation, change. Uh, cricket, like horse racing, like golf, like a lot of sports around the world, uh, is seeped in tradition and history, culture, rules and regulations. But cricket has innovated. Uh, golf has innovated as well. You know, you've got the golf sixes and cricket. They introduced a brand new format. T20, who thought that would work? Five days of test cricket is boring. Let's make something that's going to be very interesting. Let's have a shortened v version that would attract youngsters. And 
In fact, beyond that, they're introducing an even shorter version of it uh, in the UK next year, the 100, which is uh, 100 balls for each innings. Now, I think horse racing does a lot of great things, uh, but embracing the tradition uh, is something that we must never lose. We must, for example, Royal Ascot is as special as it is. I dread the day that Royal Ascot changes its dress code. I hope that remains forever. Little traditions that embraced and are, are enjoyed and are celebrated. The, one of the best organized events I work at is the Masters in America. And there is somewhere that for uh, nearly a century has kept all their traditions. You can't run, you can't walk fast, uh, you, have to, you can't use your mobile phones, you have to have them switched off, and if you are found, you are going to be sent out of the course, and they stick to those rules and traditions. Horse racing has a number of great traditions around the world, which we're all very proud of individually, and I think uh, that is the one thing that I'd like to see run right through all the sports I've been involved with, and it's important that we celebrate them as much as anything else. Terrific, thank you. Uh, and actually, uh, Cricket, that's a, a kind of lovely segue into, you've seen enormous change uh, in the sport and in, in horse racing. Fast forward four generations, you've come from four, fast forward four generations, what would you like to see uh, the new generation uh, to be experiencing? Well, uh, I think education, because I think without education you don't do anything. So educate young trainers to be better and, you know, go to good trainers to learn how to train because that's very important. Uh, and many, many other things, but we can stay here for hours if we yeah. start talking. Specifically on welfare, then, if I could stay with you, you saw the, the poll results on transparency and you yourself said it was up to the trainers to open up their stables. Given that, you know, trainers worldwide won't be able able to open up their selves to literally everybody who we would like to entice into the sport. What on welfare would you like to see in relation to transparency? How far can the sport go? People, we do welfare. Every trainer does it. They want their horses to feel good and they don't want their horses to feel bad because if they're good, they give you back what you give them. So we always in welfare, but you know, the public doesn't see the same thing. So we have to open our stable, that's for sure. We have to talk with people. I was very sorry to see that André Fab yesterday didn't want to go to the, to the conference because he's the leader in our profession. So when you're a leader, you should help the others. Mm -hmm. You should always have someone to lead you up. Mm. And Rishi, you know, as a media man, um, front foot, back foot, where do you stand on racing's response to welfare? Well, I think that sometimes racing could change how they spell the last three letters of welfare instead of F-A-R-E to E-A-R because the response often seems that we are on the back foot. We are afraid of what other people think of the sport. Um, I think Cricket has mentioned it already. Uh, John Gosling has mentioned it, the people who are involved in the sport look after their horses better than we can possibly imagine. Even a lot of us who are involved in the sport on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot of us go visiting from the media, all the racing stables around the world, we're very lucky enough to go and visit. And when you go there, you see the, the care that the horses are given, the passion that the people who are looking after the horses have for them. And that is often... Uh, hidden away because it's a daily grind and people don't have time to advertise those things. And so when outside influencers uh, and social media is dripping nowadays, as we know, with cynicism, it is a horrible place at times for people who do not have a proper understanding. And they can say whatever they want and they can pass judgment. And often the result of their judgment and their, their fears are then forced onto those administrators in the sport of horse racing. I think one thing in the UK, uh, the British Horse Racing Authority have been very good at, is that they have worked together with the government, and together the government has endorsed what the British Horse Racing has done in the UK to put uh, a slightly more forward-thinking way uh, of going about looking after the welfare of horses uh, in, 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 in the UK. And as a consequence, it has met with some criticism from those people within the sport, uh, for example, earlier in the year uh, at the Cheltenham Festival, there was uh, a huge uh, kerfuffle when 
uh, a jo few jockeys got banned for the way it appeared that they rode their horses or should have pulled them up. Uh, the, the rights and wrongs of those are to be discussed by people who know far more about horse racing and about riding and looking after horses than I do. But the perception is something that I'm involved with, both in the media and as somebody who loves horses. And what you get is you get very angry people on one side, uh, people who are the professionals who look after the horses. You get the people in the middle who are the British Horse, Ring, horse Racing Authority who are trying to appease both them and the government. And then you have the government who are trying to appease the public. It's a very difficult balance to strike. It's all these people trying to line up in the right way. Uh, the hardest thing is getting everybody to agree. Mm. But the most important thing is getting them all to work together. And sometimes a little bit of patience and thought and not worried about the fear of the people right at the end of it who don't actually know that much about racing. Not worried about their fears is very important. And more worried about uh, promoting what you do and what you do well and not being too concerned by fear. Quick follow-up question. Richard, I'd like, can I just add to yeah. what Richie said? Because I think that technology is amplifying um, all of the images. And there are those who claim to be the voice of the horse who aren't the voice of the horse. Um, the fans, the spectators, the racing clubs, there are so many more um, people that should be the voice of racing. Well, that, that, so follow-up question to all of you would be, would you recommend to this room, if they're not already, that um, each uh, leader in the sport um, opens a Twitter account and actually fills this uh, vacuum? And, uh, and how many, by the way, quick show of hands, how many of you are users of Twitter? Just to give us a sense of... You make it active users. Active there's lots users. of people who tell me they're yeah, on Twitter, okay. but, they're, but they just users. watch me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so um, your business, Victoria, City Hop, uh, I think your, your tagline, your idea is be the driver of change. Correct, correct. So, so, so give us a sense then, be the driver of change. Okay, I would love if when we all meet in South Africa, if we had embraced a hashtag, I think, I don't know if I, my slides are there, but um, we, there is a slide that I have up there. I think that we should make a commitment to doing more hashtag I heart racing or I heart, and it was the I heart the horse, I, can't, I need to see my slide. Um, and for those people who understand Twitter, you, you only get a limited number, if you could roll past Taylor Swift <laughs> and past this beautiful picture on Twitter of Karen Ma's horse in the middle of training and a pod of dolphins comes along. Now that should have gone viral but not enough people in racing or on Twitter to retweet it and make it exciting and interesting. Um, about four slides on is the hashtag, I love, we love horses. And for those of you who, um, only, who type too much when you do Twitter, you could just put I, red heart, and then the picture of the racehorse, which is three characters. There's a picture I adore there of our racehorse asleep on a strapper, on a race day. You know, all of these pictures, somebody was, I think it was you said, they say a thousand words. We have these pictures every day and I hardly ever see them on Twitter. Well, we got at least now 40 retweets of, uh, of, of that hashtag. Um, could I open this up to Q&A? Um, you've got these three eminent uh, commentators uh, here. On any aspect of uh, what we've heard this afternoon, um, and uh, any questions from the floor for any of our three? Yes, thank you. Yes, Louis Romane Richie, I would like to ask your view on the impact uh, of the new HD television, slow motion cameras who are giving it shots on the impact they have, because in the past you were having bad views of racing because it was camera that had a wide angle. Now you have a fantastic image of quality, but it shows even more the problem of uh, using the whip uh, and the reaction of the horse or the jockey. So do you think television has played a role? Are you, do you have people coming to ask you, but uh, how can you show that? Uh, uh, quite often there will be, uh, after a, a major race meeting, for example, at Royal Ascot, there will be a couple of people complaining. It is a small number, you have to remember. It's only a small number out of the entire viewing figures. I mean, if we go back to when the BBC covered racing in the UK, uh, the BBC would get 12 million viewers in the glory days uh, watching the Grand National, and perhaps you'd get 80 people complaining 
about the welfare of the horse, horses falling, the use of the whip, for example. 80 people out of 12 million. Now, I understand that more people are prepared to complain than are to say good things. Uh, however, the reality is that you cannot please every single person. I believe the overall benefit of better pictures benefits the sport. People see the horse in its, in its glory. Uh, there is something, as we, we've all talked about, when a horse is in full cry, head down, ears back, stretching out the most magnificent, majestic beast, seeing that in HD and seeing those pictures is of far more benefit, I think, than seeing uh, than the, the, the two or three or the, the small number of complaints that you may inquire. And then, obviously, if there are people who have a small concern uh, or a big concern but a small number about what they're seeing with the use of the whip, we know, we are, all of us in the sport, responsible for saying we have regulated well enough to know that that horse is fine, it's safe, it's healthy. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, no, it was just, uh, that was an Argentinian response. Okay. Any questions? I've, I've got one more, if, uh, if, you, if you will indulge me. Yes, thank I, you. I think I'm a full believer in uh, the purpose statement because I think for our organization has been fundamental. So I would like to ask you what you see as the purpose of horse racing. Uh -huh. Pre-consultancy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on the spot. I think you were getting close over here with our friend who stood up and said, you know, you want to champion, you want to be the guardians of, the champions of um, that beautiful creature called the horse and um, uh, the entertainment and fascination that John Gosden talked about. It's got to be, at the high, up here, it's got to be something that puts, as, uh, as I think uh, our friends in the UK are uh, thinking through, about putting the horse back at the centre of our national lives, about the romance of the, the horse, the fact that you are after the well-being of that horse for a lifetime. I think that's the kind of cause that you could champion. And um, I think you're close, but I think, and it's a perfect segue into our next session, it does demand that you take action, I believe. Um, but that's for the panel to, to unpack. And um, I think we have yeah. to work harder on the brand. Um, you know, when we saw all the Melbourne Cup activists come out with NUP to the Cup, hashtag, on the Taylor Swift, we should, we should have all, as an international group, have gone yup to the Cup and talked about the economic benefit, all the horses that have that come from all over the world, the um, hats that are sold. There's so much we could have done to actually support Australia, um, as and that would have shown the effectiveness of us as a global group as well. So two-part question to close this panel, and it goes like this. Let's just stay with your high-definition picture. What picture do you actually see in relation to welfare of horse racing around the world as a snapshot in time? Is the picture a, a gloomy one? Is the picture a bright and rosy one? What visual do you see? And second part to the question, depending on your first, is you've got four wise people on the Exco about to follow you up on stage who tomorrow morning will begin to address some of the actions that you you recommend and this room is recommending, what would you like to see them focus on first and foremost? Maybe, uh, Cricket, could we start with that? What picture do you see uh, uh, in relation to welfare? And what would you like these wise people to do tomorrow, first thing? I don't know, to tell you the truth. <laughs> that's a hard question. That picture that you've got there, that's a nice picture. Because people are looking and they please, they're betting. Because that's our... We need those people, especially in this country. The PMU is very important for us. Yeah. So a lot of people at the race course, like yesterday, and people are enjoying their day and things like that. Yeah. And, and, then one, and one thing that they've got to do, these, uh, the, this the executive committee tomorrow, the one thing you want them to focus on. <laughs> come back. Come back to the race course. Uh -huh. <laughs> Go back to the race course. Anytime. Okay. Thank you. Rishi. Um, it's such a difficult one to, to be specific. Uh, the picture I see is a picture where I think everybody in this room loves horse racing. They love horses. And going back to the question of purpose, a lot of people are sometimes a little bit scared to say the romantic thing. But I, I, I don't mind because I love horses and I love racing. And I, I felt passionate yesterday. I felt... I, Felt emotional when an Abel came onto the race course, and even after she got beat, I felt emotional that she was beaten. And that's 
to be embraced. The fact is, the purpose for me is to be inspired by what I see and to inspire other people by what I do. That's what I'd like to see done, and that's what I think the picture does. That's what I hope the picture does. And what I'd like to see is that picture repeated in that, in that, within that prism. That when we promote the sport, we promote it as an inspiration. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm Victoria. I'd love my last slide if it could just pop up. Um, that, that is another. Um, <laughs> together we can do more. So um, what I'd love to see tomorrow is a whole lot more emphasis on how can we work more quickly to get where we need to get. And I think it's much more than just racing. It's, uh, we just have to keep thinking about the horse and the people. And the more that we do that, the more of those stories that come out, I think the longer that this industry will be around. Thank you very much indeed. Could we have a big round of applause for our three panelists? Thank you. Thank you. Fabulous. Well, giving them absolutely no time to think through how they're going to respond to these challenges. We've got four, I was going to call them heavyweights, but I think thoroughbreds is probably uh, more appropriate. Um, could we please welcome to the stage Mr. Craig Frabell? Where are you? Thank you very much indeed. Andrew Harding is back uh, for us, uh, uh, racing director of the Hong Kong, Co uh, Hong Kong uh, Jockey Club. Thank you very much. We've got Greg Nichols. Uh, known to uh, the British Horse Racing Authority, previously in charge of the British Horse Racing Board, uh, now uh, new chair of Racing Australia, and Nick Rust, who you've seen uh, on his feet already today, uh, a racing man since childhood, formerly of Labrooks, uh, a man who I hope when Boris Johnson falls flat on his feet will take up the cudgel of our next Prime Minister for his courage and can-do uh, mentality. So... I thought, given that you are meeting tomorrow, uh, you've seen the responses to the poll questions. Um, in any change effort, and clearly in relation to welfare, this room is, is fueling a desire for change. Uh, change efforts fail for one of eight reasons, according to the great academic John Cotter. Uh, the first is by not establishing a strong enough sense of urgency. So my first question to the four of you is, is this urgent? And if so, how do you unite around a common sense of urgency? It's the burning platform question. Is it burning or is it merely uh, a little match underneath something and uh, it'll get extinguished soon? So perhaps we could start with you. Thanks, Richard. Uh, where I'd like to start is that uh, you've been spared uh, an advertorial for Australian racing. That was my original intention, but Richard said that <laughs> they don't really want to see that, so we're going to avoid it. Um, my point, I suspect, is probably a little bit contentious, but I think it warrants uh, putting it being put out there, and that is a solution to these, this very specific issue is not conformance to public pressure because that leads to suboptimal outcomes. The appropriate solution is to respond with an empathetic, purposeful policy commitment that conforms to the ideals of what humanity is about, which is caring not only of ourselves, but our environment and the things that we touch. And I don't think that um, conformance to public pressure when it's ill-informed is necessarily the appropriate task for us to undertake. Um, going back to your original question, once I've got off the soapbox, there is a... You've seen the grounds well, Richard, that there is a very strong motivating interest in putting well-being and welfare to the forefront. And I truly believe if we look back retrospectively in 12 months' time and do a report card, you will see that there's been significant improvements, enhancements of appropriate policy and not pressure policy. Right. And I've got no doubt the industry is full of goodwill. It has an ambition to play a prominent role in modern society 
And to do that, yes, we do have to conform, but don't conform to bad and ignorant policy. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Andrew. Thanks. Um, is it urgent for the International Federation? Y yes, I think it is. And I think the message that for me came from the earlier sessions was that when we talk about welfare, the one issue that could be existential for racing is deaths in racing. And from the contributions that we heard today, and I think John Gosden put it most eloquently, though everyone was pretty eloquent, was that we need clean racing. And why I think that's particularly relevant for the IFHA is that we saw the, the, uh, the photo in Jim's presentation, the black and white photo of one of the earliest meetings of what was the, the pre-runner of this organisation. What were they talking about? Medication. It was the right question then, it's the right question now. They came to the right answer then and it's the right answer now. We need clean racing. And if you look at what the International Federation has been able to do over the years, it has been what, what Brian described as what should be its characterisation for the future. It's been a global leader. Uh, we saw that several years ago in relation to anabolic steroids. So is there an urgency? Yes, there is. Is there a role for the International Federation that we need to discuss tomorrow? Yes. Um, is it radically different to what we've already known? Actually, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, I'll have to answer that from the perspective of someone who's kind of been in the eye of a storm. Uh, it's, yeah. it's deadly urgent. And, uh, and I would encourage people who sometimes aren't in the eye of that storm, who sometimes take shelter and imagine that the problem isn't theirs, um, many of us have said that over the years in the United States. And, uh, you know, we had an unfortunate situation in Santa Anita, January, February, uh, which everyone has read about. But uh, that wasn't a particularly unusual situation. We, we've all had situations with horses dying over the years. We've scratched our heads, asked ourselves why, tried to figure out what we could do better. But the fact of the matter is um, the media landscape has changed. The world perceives themselves and us differently. Um, I was doing an interview with the New York Times, uh, I think back right before the Kentucky Derby, um, with a reporter who has become somewhat questioning of his own interest in horse racing, um, and he asked me, uh, you know, what I thought about the situation. I said, look, you know, at the, at the end of the day, we all have to get up in the morning and we have to look in the mirror and ask ourselves, if we've done everything we can, are we doing everything we can to prevent this from happening to the extent humanly possible. We all know accidents can happen. Thoroughbreds are large animals. They don't recover from injuries like humans do. We don't have that level of medical technology. But I asked, you know, went back after I was talking to my wife and child, and I said, you know, the fact of the matter is we haven't done everything we can do. We, we, we haven't focused our efforts enough on research, uh, starting from birth to, to the grave, looking at everything that happens during the breeding, raising of horses, medical treatments that take place as foals and yearlings. Um, the, the racing is a great laboratory. We, we have the opportunity to investigate everything we do. Uh, and I think that's the effort that the IFHA and others in this room have to undertake, that we have to stop making excuses for ourselves. We have to stop saying it's a public relations problem that can be answered simply by good hashtags. My apologies for saying provocative things. And we have to ask ourselves, are we doing everything we can? The good news at Santa Anita in particular, California in general, there's been one fatality since June 9 during racing. Mm. We can do this. Mm. You know, there are things that have happened, you know, the uh, elimination of Butte 24 hours out from, from racing, a number of things to stop masking pain in horses that are preparing for racing. Lots of things that many of you are already doing, but I promise you, anybody who's sitting here thinking that they're already doing everything they can and doing enough is kidding themselves. So, yes, it's quite urgent. Thank you. Nick. Yeah, very urgent, um, I, uh, but I think today has been really good. Brian started off with, under Louis's leadership, you know, what's the future of the IFHA and, and its guiding principles, and Andrew just mentioned the, the, the organizing idea for us, if you like. And I think this is a perfect example of where we can test our new approach to how we're thinking about what we stand for and what we do, because if this is not in the top two challenges, probably the top one that we face, um, I'd be very surprised if people didn't, you know, uh, didn't think that. Um, so we have an opportunity under the new uh, approach to governance to say we're going to get right behind this. This is our first test. Um, you saw some interesting um, data in Brian's presentation around what the true um, expenditure of the organisation is and what is incurred. And I think that um, 
I think we're going to have to put some money in and say that this needs some central resourcing within the IFHA. And, you know, um, we've all been fighting our own um, battles, some at different points around the world. Um, uh, um, but as Victoria said earlier, we need to get together and make the effort. It shouldn't just be for the Australians to respond to what happened in Melbourne. You know, this is, we are all, we, you know, if, if Melbourne goes down, we're all going down, frankly. Um, maybe not so quickly, but we're all going down. And there is enough skill, expertise, veterinary research, um, public relations expertise, government relations management in this room that we can harness together with that central organizing um, approach, I think, within the IFHA. So tomorrow, I'll be raising that point and saying, I think we should put some resource on this centrally. Terrific. And, and to test that, Nick, um, Cotter's second principle, Cotter's second principle is about having a, a powerful guiding coalition. And the IFHA clearly, uh, from the strength and the, and, and the kind of uh, the brilliance in this room, it has that ability to become a powerful guiding coalition. But to be provocative and to push back, um, let's just take that answer to the whip use, for example, which seems to be a pretty kind of, you know, clear split between those who see it as a welfare issue and those who see it as a matter of public perception. How does the IFHA get together to reconcile that and to form some kind of united view across the world? Or am I smoking something? Thank you, Andrew. Okay, um, look, so far as the whip is concerned, um, I'm unapologetically of the view that it is a perception issue. Uh, I echo what Brian said in terms of you know, to the extent there is evidence, what the evidence shows. Um, when what we need to, to bear in mind is how much has been done already. The necessary challenge of 10 or 12 years ago was to get away from the barbarism of the whip that was used then and to, in, to introduce the padded whip. And that's something that the International Federation played a role in doing. That was the major necessary reform and that reform has been made. There are other issues that really just do go to perception. And I think from my point of view, it is important that we focus on what is truly important and truly existential for the sport, rather than getting caught up in perception issues. Once we start to pander to this group or that group, who frankly will never be satisfied, um, then uh, I think we're going to waste valuable time and energy. So what would those one or two quick wins be? If it's not the use of the whip, which I understand, what would it be um, tomorrow? You know, what goes on your kind of list of, we must do this to advance our agenda this year? I'll start with you, Andrew, and then well, we'll move uh, along. Well, again, I think our, our, our historical dedication to being a global standard setter, so far as clean racing is concerned, it's always been in the DNA of the IFHA, I think we need to do that. It was anabolic steroids several years ago. Now there's discussion about, say, bisphosphonates, the extent to which maybe these substances are being used so that a horse presents clean on an X-ray so that it can present at a sale, the extent to which it's a risk and what should be the global standard. These are the necessary uh, areas that we need to be concentrating on. I also think it's essential that in terms of not saying that everything's fantastic but not conceding the worst that's said about us, to have a strong and consistent message that in all of our countries, we do take welfare very seriously. We have regulatory vets as well as clinical vets. We spend, as uh, Paul Marie said, so much on anti-doping. We do so much to safeguard the welfare of the horse. And one of the measures that's being considered now, I think it's close to completion, is to have, together with the FEI, a global welfare charter so that we can say unapologetically, together, and individually, we have a commitment to welfare. I think that's very important Correct. for the International Federation to do. Greg? Um, again, I'm not meaning to be provocative, but essentially an international consensus is unattainable. We all have competing interests, and I know you mocked people before, Richard, about uh, placing an emphasis on commercial over and above welfare. But the reality is there are a lot of racing industries that don't have the resources available. I think the leadership can not only come from IFHA, but it can certainly come from uh, extremely uh, prosperous racing jurisdictions. And we distill that down to our friends in the room. And I think someone said earlier about protection of IP. I, I could not agree more with it. It's, this is about the promotion and preservation of something that is intrinsically 
uh, a part of me, something I love, and I've got no doubt everyone in this room has the same passion for the sport. So I think the leadership is not only IFHA's responsibility, but it's Australia, yeah. it's Hong Kong, it's Britain, it's Ireland, it's France, mm. Japan, one of the great racing nations. Uh, it's, they're the leaders that can influence the debate and then allow that to distill down. Thank you. Craig? Well, you know, I, I take this from a very optimistic standpoint. As I said at the end of my last little speech, you know, the encouraging news is we've found things and found ways that we can actually make progress. And I, to be honest with you, I think the racing crop, um, there have been a lot of conversations about that. We have some promising new uh, brands of the whip that are being uh, created in the United States, Ramon D Dominguez and his GT360 crop that um, truly is horse friendly. I mean, if you want to use that term. Um, but, but at the end of the day, on the larger scale, I think you know, we do really need to look at this as a global issue. All of these things is a global issue. We need um, global participation. Uh, and to harken back to um, what someone else said earlier, the whole issue of data, artificial intelligence, um, we all have one great thing about racetracks um, is that we have reams and reams of data. And we have reams and reams of data on, some of us have more information than others on medication use and on what happens, you know, rather than post-race testing, but during training and, and other hours. Uh, but there's so much more that we can do in terms of gathering that information, correlating it to injury, uh, figuring out ways. Tim Parkin's done great work in finding paths to identifying at-risk courses, but it's still a, a remote science. And I think uh, a sort of international data task force with the job of reducing and protecting against injury would be a huge step forward for the IFHA and all of those with any resources to contribute to. Terrific. Yeah, I've not got much to add, just to say, you know, I agree with Andrew on uh, bisphosphonates and so on. We need to get a hold of these things. Um, the ISHC um, charter that, 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 we're, that we're involved in announcing over the next uh, day or so that the IFHA is signing up to is, is great. I think we can go further and make it racing specific. And, um, you know, there's something around sharing all our learnings about medication, injury data, and, and so on, so that we can start to really communicate with our with our partners across the world, so that everyone can get the the very best of um, of the welfare information to help drive our progress and continue to refine any charter that we do put in place. Yeah. Um, that, that sort of stuff we could get on with straight away. I think. To to come back to what Andrew set up at the very beginning, I think he said the ambition was for the IFHA to become a world class international sporting federation. And I'm not a numbers man, but I saw a big gap between income and expenditure you know, and, and outcome. And I just wonder, you mentioned money and resource. Um, what are the other potential constraints that you face to become that world-class international sporting federation? So we've had money, we've had um, a willingness to share data, um, a, a need for consensus and leadership through the national bodies, not just the IFHA. What else stands in the way of you becoming world class? We cannot impose the rules. We do not have the power to yep. impose. Yep. We are a facilitator. Yes. We are recommending best practice, but we cannot impose like the Olympic Federation, the yep. Sports Federation. So that's a big. So is the ambition a kind of pipe dream? If you can't impose the rules. We have to convince. We have to, and some countries in the, this room don't have the, the, the funds available hmm. to do control out of training, for example. One immediate action would be to extend around the world the control you do yep. of horses in training before racing. Yes. In France now we do 1,000 out of 11,000 are done before the races at the training yard, but we cannot impose our mm -hmm. So that's a clear constraint. We have to convince. Yeah, it's a beautiful constraint, a clear constraint. Any other constraint? On a very similar vein, and Brian, made mention of it earlier when we uh, when he enlightened us about the progress on the governance review and that is this room is comprised of very different motivations for their sport you have some particularly obviously qatar dubai there's no wagering associated with it uh, australia is a different model altogether it's all about wagering as is hong kong um, others participants here are race clubs there's such diversity uh, and that's why i come back that the IFHA is a galvanising body, but it can galvanise the nations that can afford yeah. to make a, a very strong commitment towards uh, policy initiative um, 
galvanise those to come back and make that available to our to our, our fellow uh, race lovers. Yeah, Andrew. Um, I, I mean, to a large extent, echoing what Greg said, one of the major constraints is that we're not um, a homogenous group. Um, some of us in the room, the organisation I work for, Hong Kong Jockey Club, is perfectly integrated. Wagering operator, racing operator, racing authority. Um, others in the room uh, are not uh, racing authorities. So that's a difficulty. But what I would say, on a, to strike a note of optimis optimism, in my career in racing, I've worked for the most beautifully integrated model in the world. Um, and the second most fragmented model in the world in terms of Australia. And there's a lot that can be achieved if one's clear about objectives and one employs the tools of persuasion. And if there's a good case for something, then in my experience, it might take you a bit longer, but you can get there. You've got to articulate the case and you've got to execute against it. Uh, I think my dad used to tell me all the time that um, rather than yelling at me and screaming and uh, things like that to get me to comport to his version of behavior that he just tried to lead by example. And, and at the Breeders' Cup, you know, not for commercials here, but that's, that's really what we've tried to do with American and international racing is set great examples for the rest of the world to follow. Now, sometimes that requires much greater expenditure of funds than is available to other people. But I think that's something we need to think about as leading racing organizations and a leading organization in the IFHA is how can we lead by example. We obviously, to Louis' dismay, can't do it by compulsion. Uh, so that requires extraordinary kinds of leadership. I would say as an organizational, you know, probably shouldn't say it out loud, but it's hard to uh, galvanize efforts and to disseminate information uh, with volunteer staff. Essentially, we have you know, Andrew committing his time when he has a real job and we know how hard it is to work for Winfred, so. Um, Very easy. Very easy. What is the best? You have any comments on that, Andrew? <laughs> uh, in any case, I think, you know, we need to, like Nick said, what, what kind of resources, we have a problem. I think we all tend to agree on that. What resources do we need to commit to it? How do we address that? And what kind of staffing levels do we need to do that? Those are questions we should ask tomorrow. These are great, great questions, and I, I mean, I've, I've um, lived through the pain myself, by the way, of being expected to bring change to a global organisation without any resource and just doing it through uh, pure influence and, and cajoling and inspiration, etc. Um, I guess, therefore, I, I'm curious to know what would the IFHA want to keep uh, and add resource to to drive centrally, knowing that 99% of the effort is going to take place outside the, uh, the IFHA and that you are there to influence set policy, be best practice, uh, not set policy, um, uh, you know, uh, share best practice. What, what tasks would you like to keep at the center uh, and to add fuel to? And I'm looking at Nick for the first answer to this. Uh, well, well, I think there's th a lot of information sharing that can take place. So this is no criticism whatsoever of the existing setup, and, and Andrew's general secretary does a, a great job as far as I'm concerned. Um, but, you know, our members should really, all of you in this room, should get access to information about our top priorities that we agree through the IFHA. So if, if welfare is top priority and the story comes out about um, Santa Anita, uh, yes, we can all read about it in the in the newspapers, but actually we should have um, an update on this is what's happening on the ground, this is where we are, this is the repository of information that's being deployed, this is Louis has written, uh, which I believe he did, <laughs> um, uh, and, and provided a, a support letter, this is the lobbying that might be going on, here's how we're going to join up with other jurisdictions to, to get behind this, so that our members are aware of, you know, the, 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 the database of veterinary science, the arguments that are being used globally to, to try and maintain our position with governments and so on, um, and so that we've got a resource that's driven into action. I'd like to see some of that, and that doesn't have to cost a huge amount of money to support. Yeah. Uh, but only on the IFHA's members' agreed top priorities, because the other ones can be dealt with locally. Yep. Other thoughts on that? No? No, okay. So I'm going to open this up again to the floor um, before I push these gentlemen to uh, get even more concrete on the actions that uh, they might wish to take to narrow the gaps that you've identified between where you are and where you wish to be, specifically on welfare. So who would like to um, open up uh, the questions from the floor? Wow. Thank you.
Yes, yeah, so a- Andrew uh, took the position that whipping is a perception issue. There is a saying in public relations that perception is reality as far as the public is concerned. So how do you, how do you square those two? Um, <laughs> what I'd say, Rick, is that um, I'm, I'm speaking here um, from, a, uh, from, a, from a point of view that, that the world isn't the same all over. Um, if I look to Australia, and so I, I have some experience in this particular field. I was the chief executive of, racing, of the Australian Racing Board, as, as it then was, when we made the major changes to the whip there. Um, and I think, uh, by and large, w- what we did there was the right thing to do. But I say by and large because I think we went too far. We went too far in making an issue then about the number of times the whip was used. And I think once we got into that, it was a, an argument we were never going to win. I think there's a beautiful simplicity to the, to the, to the provision that exists in some other countries. The rip, whip shouldn't be used unnecessarily. And to say the major change was to introduce the padded whip. And I haven't lived there for seven years now, but you know, my sense is that it's not the burning issue in terms of the, the racing public's mind. And if I look at other jurisdictions in Asia, um, I don't think that if you took a poll of the public, they would be returning a response that, well, uh, the whip, whip's use in racing is an issue that uh, they are terribly concerned about. I think the, the fact is, and perhaps, perhaps to an extent this is the education that we undertake, um, we make it known that every horse that returns after racing in Hong Kong is examined. And if a horse has been marked, and you said in 30, 30 years of experience, you have never or very rarely seen a horse injured as a result of the whip, that's an important message to convey. And it's certainly the experience we have in Hong Kong. But it's not limited to Hong Kong. If I look to Asia more generally and Australasia, it seems to me that it's perhaps not the issue that it is in California. So the notion that we should, as our number one priority, say tomorrow, let's come to a position of banning the use of the whip, I think that would be misplacing our energies, quite frankly. No, I, I, certainly I will say at the, on the Welfare Committee, we are very sensitive to cultural changes. For example, in the U.S., horse slaughter is just absolutely uh, unacceptable. Uh, but I was actually rather surprised in California that, that the animal rights activists were as upset about horse whipping as they were with horse fatalities. So it, it certainly is a cultural thing, and it's, it's one of those issues that we have to deal with on the Welfare Committee when we try to re- make recommendations to the Expo. Richard, I'll just tell a little story about this. Two years ago, my uh, then 14-year-old daughter um, wrote an essay for her school class, um, never asked me about it or showed it to me, but about two months later, I got it. Um, and in it, she wrote about how she had grown up in racing. She'd started going to the racetrack when she was two months old and spent time on the backstretch uh, in California with some of the best trainers in the world, rode their ponies around the backstretch. And uh, this, I think, was her eighth grade essay about how she had grown disillusioned with racing because of two things. One is medications that were administered to horses to uh, convince them to run further and faster and sooner than perhaps they should. The second was um, she couldn't stomach the use of the riding crop. Now, she's an equestrian. Um, To my financial dismay, she loves nothing more than riding horses. But uh, when we talk about how are we going to attract the next generation, I mean, by all accounts, someone who's grown up in it, been exposed to it, seen the best of it, ought to be the next generation. And she had been turning her back on it. I did ask her, I said, you are aware I'm the chairman of the Jockey Club Safety Committee. You didn't ask me about either of those topics in your essay. And she goes, yeah, I know what you would say. So, um, <laughs> but anyway, I think, I think we need to be you know, quite conscious of what that ne- next generation is going to say. Yeah, yeah. Other questions? Thank you. Vicky. I don't think it's just the next generation. I think we're seeing a real shift in older people as well. I saw some research out of the States quite recently that 60% of consumers are now more concerned about how all animals, not just horses, are fed, watered, um, and the antibiotic use. Um, I think, well, I'll ask a question to you. Do you think that it's not just young people, it's people, as we become more urbanized, that are looking at our industry differently? Um, Well, my wife, who's quite a bit older than my daughter, um, was fully in agreement with everything in the essay. So 
uh, I would say, yes, we have to be quite conscious of that. You know, I, I do think, and to echo some of the things Greg said, we do a lot of great things in this business, and there are things that um, are extraordinary. I mean, just, you know, m that same daughter had the opportunity to go visit American Pharaoh in Bob Baffert's barn, who basically put his head on her shoulder and, uh, and created a relationship with her there in just a matter of a few minutes. So, I mean, we do have great stories. We have great care. You know, I think one of the great Somebody asked me about two weeks ago, it's like, what do you think um, people's biggest misconception about horse racing is? And I said, you know, to me, a lot of people think we don't care. And, and I think that's the farthest thing from the truth, that everyone in this room cares about the animals, about their welfare, about their treatment, about their safety, and about riders. And, and no one in their right mind wants to go to a racetrack and see anything bad happen to a horse. That's not, this isn't a blood sport where we take pleasure from that. So I think, you know, one of the things that, I think comes through the term empathy. We have to show not only that we do care, but demonstrate that in concrete ways that people understand. I think we have a lot of work to do in that, and that's another area where the IFHA can play a positive role. We've got two more poll questions, but let's take a question at the back first. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to ask about Taylor Swift. So American singer, Australian race, front, front page news in the UK. What one thing does the panel think the IFHA should do in response to that story and, and do nothing is an option. And Martin, you, you are Martin from the British Horse Racing. Sorry, yes, Director of Comms for the BHA. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll give the cop-out answer, Martin, which is that, uh, that tomorrow at the IFHA Expo, we have, to, we have to agree a plan for how we're going to deal with the challenges we face overall. I don't think we should respond specifically on the Taylor Swift issue, but it is a it is a totem for what we are facing. And it should be an encouragement to ensure that we don't leave this go by until next year's conference and we get on with things centrally as best we can. Well, the Australian response was quite simple. Um, and I probably shouldn't characterize it as Australian Victoria Racing Club, which owns the Melbourne Cups. Quite simple. It just moved on to the next issue. Now, is that appropriate? I don't probably believe in uh, thinking that that is an appropriate step to take. But isolating issues and focusing on isolated issues, notwithstanding her prominence worldwide, is a step to disaster. What does need to happen is a communication plan and uh, not a one-size-fits-all communication plan. But we know that these issues are not going to abate. We know they're going to continue to arise. But communication, uh, devising a, a public plan to, uh, to to position our sport in a very favourable light has got to be... Now, I know they're nebulous words, but ultimately responding on singular issues is uh, is not an appropriate course of action in my mind. But a communication plan and working towards establishing protocols to respond in circumstances such as this in the future is, is a possible way of going forward. Uh, th thanks. Um, again, I, I think responding tactically to what happened in that particular case wouldn't be the role of the IFHA. But what the IFHA should, I think part of our function is to, to be alive to public sentiment, to understand what developments are taking place. And from that, that what, what, what was potent and what what galvanised her, her fans to be so outraged at the notion that she would appear there was this tagline, racing kills. That's, that's to me the message that we need to take from that. Again, the thing that we need to be worried about is the perception taking hold that racing kills and that should inform everything that we do as an international federation around welfare. So I'm... Any, any other questions? We've got two, one from Rishi, and then I'm going to, okay, I'm one over there, and then I've got two quick poll questions for you. Sam, sorry, um, obviously this primarily start with you, Nick, but then if anybody on the panel would like to join in. A lot of what we've talked about today is about trying to talk about to the public about educating them about what we're doing within racing and be confident about what we're doing. Would the sport benefit, considering sometimes in the UK in particular, Nick, uh, there are professionals who are somewhat ignorant to what public perception is, that racing professionals can be educated to what those public perceptions are in order for them to be prepared for any issues that may arise. Uh, yes, Rishi, and I, 
I think perhaps um, in the last couple of years, um, I perhaps haven't got it quite right in terms of the way that we've tried to communicate to racing's professionals to say that we need you to understand what's what's going on so that you can respond in the right way. We had one or two examples where, you know, the racing's professionals have kicked back and sort of said, you know, if, well, there was one quote, wasn't there? If, if you don't like it, go and watch Peppa Pig. Um, but actually that completely, mi it's, it's fine, uh, but it completely misses the point. Those who would be quite happy watching Peppa Pig instead of coming racing are also those same people who can stop racing, I believe. Um, so I, I, do think, I do think our racing professionals um, understand, but I constantly hear this, it's worth too much money will be all right type comment. And I think that is misplaced. So I would support some more education. It's maybe something we can pick up on that front. I think there's your answer, Richie. Thank you very much. And we've got one final question over here. Yeah. So would you be in favor of canceling the use of the whip is your question forever? Okay. Hang on one second. We're just going to get a microphone to you. And in brief, if you could just pray see your question. Okay. It's okay. I just would like to ask if you are, will be in favor to cancel the whip definitely. I am. And I believe that the jockey is they are athletes that they could manage without the whip, and the trainers could manage to train their horses without using the whip. So uh, let me answer that question by dodging it somewhat. Um, since I represent one organization for another month and will then be representing another organization, yes. I have to be very careful about <laughs> what I say and who it's interpreted that I'm saying it for. But, uh, yeah. But, oh, yeah, I'm also associated with the jockey club. So, uh, but the fact of the matter is I think there are a lot of things in the, this industry that we hold on to, that we hold on to without great need. And, uh, you know, my personal view, that would probably be one of them, that we can look at reasonable restrictions on the use of the crop or ultimately the elimination of it. And horses will still run. Uh, the best rider will probably prevail along with the best horse. Um, and like many other things, I'll give you one example. In California, 11 years ago or so, um, we had a proposal in front of the California Horse Racing Board to eliminate the use of steroids um, in, in training and racing. And uh, a, a large number of uh, people in the racing training community said, you know, if you do that, we won't fill a race next week. The regulation went effective. Uh, two weeks later, entries for the races took place, and uh, we went on as if nothing had happened. And I think there's dozens of things that if we look carefully at ourselves and say, is that something we really need uh, and we do change it, we're going to find out that all of our fears and frustrations and everything else were sometimes overstated. So I, I do think it's, you know, you know, my personal view is we would go on well without, um, but only time will tell. But, I, you know, I think it's something we ought to take a very serious look at. In the interests of time, thank you. I'm gonna anybody else? Anybody else? I think we've kind of covered that topic. And, and what I'd love um, this group to have, at least, is this room's view of remit. So I, we've got two more poll questions, really, to kind of close I the. Uh, you've I don't have a question. I just want to put forward to the floor a proposal that I have had been discussing with my French colleague for a very long time, and which is very simple. The whip is necessary to maintain sometimes it's directional, you know, to direct. Oh, okay. My proposal is the use of, is the, to have the whip but without dropping the rein. And I think everyone can think about this. The whip just on the side, not not dropping the rein. And it's an objective criteria because the issue about I was listening earlier on when you were saying abuse, not too much, this and that. It's subjective and it depends on the stewards, it depends on the legislation, it depends on the culture. Dropping or not dropping the, the rain is an objective criteria. Thank you for that intervention. Thank you very much. Two polling questions. Let me uh, ask the first one. If we could have the first polling question, please. Um, so, last use of your devices. Should the IFHA lead coordinated efforts worldwide to address welfare practices and perceptions? It's a yes or no. It's a yes or no.
It shouldn't take 30 seconds, this one. You'll have formed a view by now, but we'll give you the 30 seconds. Okay, and tantalizingly, the answer is going to come now. Hooray! Very, very good. So could the 8% make themselves known? Um, that's the first. Now there's a follow-up question to test you even further on your intentions. So if we could have the next one, please. Would you be prepared to dedicate additional resources or funds to support the IFHA executive focus on welfare, perception, coordination, and lobbying? So those 92% who said yes, and now maybe the floating 8%, are you prepared to put your money where your mouth is? It's one for yes, no is a two, and three, you're just about to uh, make up your mind. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Richard, uh, just one thing before people vote. Please. Just realise I've had a governance subcommittee for the last 12 months, and here we are asking you to make a decision in 30 seconds that, yes. <laughs> that Brian has dwelt over for 12 months and has asked for another 12 months extension. Yeah. So here, here's the spirit of this. Andy Grove, when he was trying to change Intel uh, from its position of strength to something even better, he fired the entire board and looked at the world through the fresh eyes of hungry entrepreneurs. So it's a yes, it's a no, and we've got the answers. Thank you very much. You haven't messed about here. It's 56% is a yes, 10% are no, and 32% are unsure at this time. Gentlemen, I'm not quite sure you, what you do with this data, but I think, I think the game is on. Um, could I please, uh, on your behalf, thank the four of you for putting yourself up on the floor. Thank you all very, very much. And I believe, Mr. Chairman, the floor is yours. I want to thank really very warmly all the members of the Executive Council that have been taking part to these panels. I think I've been hearing more from them than at any exco meeting. So no, I want to thank everybody. I think it's been a very interesting day with a lot of exchange, probably more exchange than we normally have. I want to thank Nick for the tremendous work he has done. He was knowing what, he, what the responsibility he was taking when we decided that our last Exco meeting to have this session, which was uh, certainly the, the session we should have, but with risk uh, of difference of opinion. Well, very clearly, for me, what I will always keep is what was said by several speakers and very clearly by John Gosden, is that as racing authorities, which is the aim of the majority of our members and their role, not, not everybody is, but many are, is that we must do everything we can to guarantee a level playing field. And anything which is done uh, is important and we must also guarantee the safety of the horses and the riders. We know that we have a big task in front of us. Uh, I was listening very, very quietly uh, what we must decide tomorrow, so I'm not sure we need to meet. You just have to make the resume of what was told today, and you have the, you have the answers. But I think uh, the interactive idea was a very good idea, uh, Nick. Uh, thank you for this uh, interactive pro pro introduction. I think it will be used certainly in other conferences within the racing world uh, in the future. Uh, I want to thank especially my three vice chairmen for the time they, they give to us. And you've seen for the governance uh, review, uh, the work it has to be done. I'm worried about our resources and uh, what we have to achieve. Uh, I would like to explain my uh, thanks to uh, all the team and to Andrew Harding, Andrew Chesser, and James Ogilvy, who are doing a great work for the Federation. Our committee chairs and vice chairs uh, as you've seen uh, earlier on in the governance review plan, uh, there is a lot of people uh, who are working for us. 
free of charge, uh, at the charge of their own organization. Uh, I would thank to the leadership and management of France Gallo, our host, including President Edouard de Rothschild. I wish him good luck for the election in December. I should not, but <laughs> we are working internationally together very closely. Thanks to our team of secretary. Uh, thank you for the, the, the work they done, Catherine and, uh, and Chloe, who came this year. Uh, thank you uh, to all the, uh, the technicians who have been working, Saturn Production and uh, the Hyper Master. And uh, thank you to Shannon Luss, to our interpreters who make this conference, to the technical team of France Gallo, uh, to Olivier Deloire and Henri Pouret. Every time we need them, they are there to help us, and it's very precious. And our whole team of technical uh, advisors, uh, with Dr. Gado, Dr. De Vos, and all, all the other who are working for the, for the Federation. So we will, as usual, finish with the film of the ARC. And it will remind you nine, a nice moment we had yesterday. So if you can please play the film. Le Qatar Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe, la plus grande course du monde, une édition 2019 qui s'annonce fantastique avec Enable qui est en quête d'un triplé, un triplé inédit, la championne de Lanfranco de Tori, grande favorite de la course qui a pris un bon départ, qui est pour le moment en 4 5 e position alors que se rapproche vivement à l'extérieur Gayat, un cheval qui a énormément d'action et qui va sans doute imprimer son rythme à ce championnat du monde du pur sang. Gayat donc qui est en tête, qui est resté pour le moment en droite ligne avec Fierman qui est bien parti, l'autre cheval japonais Blast One Piece, Kazakh Bleu Clair revient en troisième position avec le numéro 9, Magical qui est également en bon rang, Sotsas le meilleur 3 ans français pour le moment en cinquième position avec Enable qui est tout près dans le sillage des animateurs Valgast venant au milieu du peloton qui s'équite un petit peu plus loin avec le numéro 1 French King qui patiente à l'arrière-garde sauf là qui est en avant-dernière position et c'est pour le moment Nagano Gold qui ferme la marche le haut de la montée déjà avec Gaillat qui a toujours l'avantage, Magical qui est deuxième, Fierman qui vient en troisième position, la grande favorite Enable pour le moment un très bon parcours, elle est quatrième, elle est marquée de près d'ailleurs par Sotsas avec Kizeki Valguest qui vient ensuite dans cet ordre, Japan est un petit peu plus loin, French King qui patiente à l'arrière-garde avec Softla qui est toujours Nagano Gold qui ferme la marche, trois chevaux qui se détachent légèrement, Gaillat qui a l'avantage avec Magical qui est deuxième, nous avons Fierman ensuite qui vient en troisième position, Enable qui est quatrième, la Franco Détori qui ne s'affole pas. Nous avons Sotsas ensuite qui est cinquième. Blast One Piste déjà un petit peu sollicité qui vient à son extérieur. Valgas est un petit peu plus loin. French King toujours côté corde. Japan qui patiente à l'arrière-garde avec Softlack et Nagano Gold. La fausse ligne droite avec Gaillat qui a toujours le meilleur. Magical librement qui est deuxième, qui est suivi par Enable, toujours marqué par Sotsas avec Valgast qui de son côté marque l'effort de Sotsas. La ligne d'arrivée avec Gaillat qui est déjà sollicité. Magical librement d'elle-même qui a l'avantage dans son sillage, la grande championne. Enable, l'enfant côté Tori qui n'a toujours pas bougé. Sotsas qui est lancé maintenant à l'extérieur et puis Japan qui s'annonce à son tour. Enable qui prend l'avantage. Sotsas qui vient maintenant l'attaquer avec Japan qui lutte également pour la victoire. Enable peut-être en route pour le triplé mais Sotsas c'est là, les trois ans, les trois ans de long qui sont ça qui sont là, mais Enable qui a toujours l'avantage elle est seule en tête, Enable, elle a le meilleur Valgas qui se lente maintenant à sa poursuite Enable côté corde, Valgas à l'extérieur Enable, Valgas est-ce que Valgas va enfin battre Enable Oui, c'est Valgas qui s'impose, Enable, merci champion et deuxième, Sotsas troisième et la quatrième place pour Japan Valgas, incroyable, Pierre-Charles Boudot qui remporte ici l'arc de Trillon son premier arc pour Pierre-Charles Boudot cet après-midi, debout sur les étriers PC, et c'est formidable ce que réalise cet après-midi à Walgues, c'est l'entraînement d'André Favre, Monsieur Favre qui renoue avec la victoire dans l'arc. Il s'impose ici pour une énième fois, pour la huitième fois précisément pour André Favre. Il bat, il bat, Enable, la championne, il n'y a rien à reprocher à Enable hein, qui a été remarquable et qui se place deuxième. Quelle phase finale Thierry, on a vécu un grand, très grand moment de sport. Ouais, tout à fait. Thank you very much. Have a good trip back. Thank you for taking so much participation.